Siempre Cuba ha estado luchando por su libertad. Murieron 100.000 personas. No pudo triunfar, pero cambió el país. There is little question that Meyer Lansky had thoroughly corrupted Batista. It's not a lie. They didn't promise anything. They promised a revolution. They did a revolution. Эти ребята обязательно будут либо мучениками, либо национальными героями. He told Khrushchev, you should unleash the entire Soviet nuclear arsenal. Apocalypse. Lush forests, a blue ocean, and sunny tropical weather. Cuba has been a favorite vacation spot since at least the 1920s. Tourism picked up tremendously in the 1930s as people, especially from the United States, were drawn also by Cuba's low prices and plentiful liquor. How did this almost magical island become the playground of the American Mafia? turned Fidel Castro, a Jesuit schoolboy, into the leader of an armed rebellion? And why did all of Cuba's ambitious political reforms fail within a decade? Cuba's history is marked by 500 years of poverty and oppression. But the Cubans have never given up on their dream of freedom. Since 1934, Cuba has been ruled by a number of puppet governments under the control of General Fulgencio Batista. He was a non-commissioned officer before taking power in a military coup. He had Cuba's largely white army officers of Spanish descent removed. For the first time, Cuba was ruled by someone of native descent. Batista is eigentlich an extrem akzeptierter Mensch, sowohl was alle Gruppen auf Kuba betrifft und was sozusagen die informellen äh, Klientel, äh, Freundschafts- und Familiensysteme sind, ist er extrem akzeptiert. As the head of the army, Batista ran the country from behind the scenes. The elected presidents were his puppets. Cuba's neighbor, the United States, saw in him a strong man who could restore peace and quiet to Cuba. Batista developed policy in agreement with the American ambassador. Que era un jovencito de la gente más pobre de la sociedad. Era todavía no tenía más que 31 años de edad, un joven. Y él se vendió al embajador de Estados Unidos. Se entregó, traicionó lo que estaba haciendo en ese momento su país. Cuba is barely 90 miles from the American coast. Washington's political elite was surprised by Batista's coup d'etat. It took some time for them to come to terms with him. U.S. corporations had invested heavily in Cuba's agriculture, especially its sugar cane. Their interests had to be preserved. To the surprise of many, General Batista bade farewell to his uniform in 1940 in order to run for president of Cuba. The former military dictator decided to run on a platform that promised prosperity for all Cubans. Und er macht's ja auch. 
Er baut eine neue Armee aus, auf aus äh, farbigen Unterschichten. Das ist der Aufstieg sozusagen der Söhne von Sklavinnen und Sklaven oder Enkel von Sklavinnen und Sklaven. Äh, das ist der Aufstieg der Afrokubaner und er macht das gleich in der Polizei. As a candidate in the presidential election, he strove to implement the promises made during the 1933 revolution. The United States warned Batista against continuing the reforms, but Cuba's intellectuals supported him. Sie wollten Politik verändern und deswegen haben sich gerade auch sehr viele Intellektuelle und Schriftsteller damals für diese Republik, für auch für die Verfassung von 1940 engagiert. Batista's crowning achievement was to give Cuba a new constitution. It allowed a land reform, established women's suffrage, and cemented the eight-hour workday. Et cette constitution de 1940 est considérée comme, à l'époque, l'une des plus démocratiques de l'Amérique latine, tout simplement parce que, étant arrivée au pouvoir à partir d'une révolution, euh, disons, sociale, la révolution de 1933, euh, cette, cette constitution de 1940 inclut des éléments euh, progressistes de droit du travail, etc. Fulgencio Batista brought together both conservative and leftist factions. This allowed him to unite the majority of Cubans behind his banner and be elected in the autumn of 1940. This was a period of significant prosperity in Cuba. It was a period of a lot of happiness because Cubans saw that the revolution had finally came to power. Cuba became a paradise for new ideas. The whole population was to benefit from the flourishing economy. Politicians in Washington were concerned. For them, Batista's reforms were socialist and communist pipe dreams. But many Americans discovered Cuba as a vacation destination just off their coast. Seit dem Alkoholverbot in den USA sind die ja schon immer da äh, ausgewichen hin. Ähm und äh, mit der ersten Touristenwelle, also 20er Jahre, äh, 30er Jahre, äh, gibt es auch sehr starke Beziehungen. Also alles, was tropisch, luxuriös und etwas verrucht ist, spielt eigentlich in Kuba statt, nicht in den USA. Prohibition in the USA from 1919 to 1933 made Cuba and turned Cuba into one of America's best kept tourist secrets. Life here was cheap and alcohol flowed freely and legally. While official relations between Cuba and the United States flourished, America's organized crime also set up shop on the island. During Prohibition, they smuggled liquor from Cuba to the mainland. The FBI tried to counter these smuggling tricks with films such as this one, smuggling liquor in oil cans. It was almost like um, if you knew the series um, Boardwalk Empire, it really was coming in on boats and ships and things like that. And then f sometimes they would float, the barrels would float on the shore. Sometimes they were picked up properly, loaded off of docks and then put into warehouses. Cuba was at the heart of rum production. To this day, the former headquarters building of rum giant Bacardi is a Cuban landmark. Caribbean rum promised freedom and adventure. Whereas it once was the drink of choice of sailors and pirates, Cuba's rum had now been discovered by tourists. The Cubans began mass production. The basic raw material was at hand and manufacturing was inexpensive. Cuban rum was a worldwide success. Es la gran compañía de rones en Cuba a partir de la destilación de la caña de azúcar asentada en el oriente del país, esencialmente en Santiago de Cuba, y se convierte en un monopolio de esta industria con una fuerza muy grande. The Bacardi family was originally from Catalonia in Spain. They perfected the recipe for rum in Cuba. The bat on the company's logo is an old Cuban symbol of good fortune. Rum became a staple drink in the most famous bars of the world, where revelers mixed it with Coca-Cola, making the world's most famous long drink, the Cuba Libre. Es ist eigentlich ein, 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 ein Rachenputzer, ein Unterschichtenprodukt, was dann so langsam über Werbemaßnahmen in die 
in die normale Welt kommt. In the 1920s and 30s, Bacardi opened factories in Barcelona, New York and San Juan in Puerto Rico. The family business became the best known Cuban company of all time. Rum is part of Cuba, as much as its cigars, the sea, and its many small fishing boats. It was part of the attraction for an American journalist who came to Cuba to fish, but ended up staying, Ernest Hemingway. Even today, for many visitors, he embodies the Cuban way at life, at one with nature, enjoying life, and with a sharp tongue. Hemingway and Cuba, the relation tuvo mucho que ver tuvo tuvo mucho que ver con el mar tuvo que ver mucho con el mar eh, él vino a Cuba por las primeras veces eh, buscando la pesca en la en la corriente del Golfo pero que pero que luego mm, se convirtió en un sitio mm, amable para para vivir Hemingway spent many years in Cuba the island notably inspired Hemingway's most famous work a novella about an elderly Cuban fisherman. The Old Man in the Sea won Hemingway the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954. De ahí que cuando él gana el premio Nobel a partir de esta novela se lo dedica al pueblo cubano, porque es una gratitud entre la psicología que él trae como autor como un extranjero que participa, pero también el mundo vivencial que ha vivido con los pescadores cubanos. In the 1930s, it was not hard for a tourist such as Hemingway to settle in Cuba. Writers such as he were welcome. Ordinary jobs, however, were primarily reserved for Cubans, and the island no longer welcomed immigrants. In May 1939, the steamliner MS St. Louis, carrying hundreds of refugees from Hamburg, Germany, arrived in Cuba seeking asylum. The MS St. Louis was a ship uh, full of Jewish refugees that left Hamburg and was going to come to the United States. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt refused to accept those refugees. So they went to Cuba and they tried to negotiate with the Cuban government which was led at that time by Batista and another general named Benitez and tried to pay for each refugee. The Cuban government demanded such exorbitant sums that only a few refugees were able to pay. More than 900 Jewish passengers were forced to return to Europe. Many of them would be killed during the Holocaust sind mehrere Dampfer, die ähnliche Schicksal haben, nur die St. Louis wird dann eben auf diese grausame Art und Weise zurückgewiesen. Ist einer der wenigen Schiffe, das in der Karibik nicht irgendwo noch anlaufen kann. Die anderen sind dann nach Santo Domingo angelaufen und sind dann, leben dann halt in Sasua irgendwann mal. Eine Reihe ist auch nach Venezuela gegangen oder Kolumbien. Und die St. Louis ist eigentlich die einzige, die faktisch in Kuba abgewiesen wird, weil schon so sehr viele Emigranten da sind. Much like the United States before it. Cuba forbade access to its territory. The immigrant era was over. At the beginning of World War II, Cuba's position in the Caribbean made it strategically very important, both as a central shipping hub and for the U.S. Navy. Merchant liners and warships sailed from Cuba to cross the Atlantic. When the U.S. entered the war in 1941, Cuba sided with its powerful neighbor, joined the anti-Hitler coalition, and supported U.S. troops as a supply base. Well, they were in Guantanamo, and they were in, uh, in, in the Isle of Pines, and the American Navy visited Cuba. Uh, Cuba provided sugar and, and other goods to the United States, so it was a close relationship, yes. Cuba's president, Fulgencio Batista, made an official visit to his American ally. President Franklin Roosevelt welcomed him with all due ceremony. Reservations about Batista's previous links to the Communist Party appeared to have been forgotten. 
Batista had the support of the United States. He collaborated with the United States during World War II. This is a period of the war. Uh, the communists who couldn't ally themselves with the more leftist, uh, progressive elements ally themselves with Batista. This was a time also that the United States and the Soviet Union became ally against Nazi Germany. Cuba benefited from its usefulness to the American military machine and its economy prospered. Part of the profits were invested in upgrading Cuba's own armed forces. Batista himself profited from the arms trade. He acted as an intermediary for armament industrialists and took a cut of each purchase his army made. When he came to that moment, he was not that he was a millionaire. He was a man who was a man who was a man who was a man who was a man. Das ist im Grunde das im, im Rahmen der, der sozusagen der inoffiziellen Sozialpolitik, Aufstiegspolitik. Jeder, der eine Machtposition hat, von dem wird erwartet, dass er seine Familie versorgt und dass er seine Freunde versorgt. Many people in Cuba were provided for, and the president more than anyone else. Cuba's coastline is studded with grand hotels, most of which were built by the mafia in the 1940s. The Americans opened uh, gambling in Cuba in a number of hotels as tourism began to increase. Uh, the mafia uh, took over some hotels. Not any different than Chicago or Las Vegas. So Cuba was another spot where the mafia controlled the gambling business. Many tourists complained about cheating in the casinos. Batista was apparently unable to control the gambling bosses. The problem with cheating was terrible in Havana. Um, you had people rigging games, they had little devices that they could uh, stop wheels from spinning in a certain way. And that was a real problem because in the short term, of course, it attracted degenerate gamblers. But in the long term, it uh, offended people who really wanted to have an honest game. Batista wanted to stop fraud in the casinos. To put an end to cheating, he hired a notorious mafia figure. Meyer Lansky began in Cuba, not really as a casino owner, but as a consultant, that he received a fee for running the games honestly. Meyer Lansky was a respected figure for both the Italian and Jewish mafia, with the reputation of being fair in business and ruthless with cheats. Lansky cleaned up Cuba's casinos and hotels and brought them in line with his U.S. business interests. Stricter gambling rules were imposed, hotels prospered, profits flowed in, and Lansky took his cut. There were a lot of American businesses that were already successful in Cuba, the sugar business, uh, the telephone business, but the mob really focused on travel and tourism and casino gambling. Well, Cuba was one close to the United States, received significant tourism. Batista protected, uh, during his period, protected the mafia and the gambling. Uh, so the mafia did well, prospered, and had a nice vacation place near Miami and to go and, and spend uh, winters. Thus, with the blessing of President Batista, Cuba became an El Dorado for the mafia in the 1940s. Huge profits, no police hassles, and an ideal money laundering machine. Cuba was very attractive to the mob because it was legal. Uh, there was not much they could do in the U.S. that was legal uh, because you had to follow the money, you had to trace money. But the mob could go into Havana and build casinos and hotels perfectly legally. Now, the money that was used was not obtained legally in the U.S., but 
what was literally happening is people with duffel bags of cash would go into Havana and buy hotels and casinos. Among those investing in Cuba early on was also the United States' most feared mafia boss, Charles Lucky Luciano, head of the famous Cosa Nostra. In 1936, the FBI had managed to arrest Luciano for forced prostitution. But his friend and confidant, Meyer Lansky, hatched a plan to get Luciano out again. With the United States at war with both Germany and Italy, the U.S. government feared sabotage and spies, especially in New York Harbor. And they knew the docks were controlled by Luciano's Italian associates. The U.S. Navy brought in Meyer Lansky, and Meyer was able to convince Lucky Luciano, who was in prison, to urge Italians to cooperate and keep their eyes open on the waterfront. Now, what was in this for Lucky Luciano, who was in jail, doing 30 to 50 years? Well, Meyer had a plan, and the plan was if Luciano cooperated with the war effort by giving the order to go and help find Nazi spies and to help find loyal people in Sicily for when General Patton invaded, maybe Luciano would be let out of jail. The condition for Luciano's release was simple. He had to cooperate and would be deported to his native Italy at the end of the war. In 1940, future revolutionary leader Fidel Castro was 14 years old. He and his brother Raul were the illegitimate children of a wealthy Cuban landowner. Their father had sent them to attend a church-run private boarding school in Santiago de Cuba. Fidel Castro and Raul Castro studied in a school of Jesuitas. I studied with the Jesuitas. Ser jesuita no es ser católico o ir a misa un domingo. Ser jesuita es una manera de entender el mundo y de proyectarte en el mundo. It was an all-boys school. Fidel is standing to the right with a pencil in his mouth. Parce que, si vous voulez, Castro, chez les jésuites, il, il était réputé en tant qu'athlète, en tant que sportif. Donc on sent bien que c'est un homme, euh, que son gabarit, euh, le, son gabarit le montre, un homme qui avait besoin d'exprimer quelque chose de physique. His competitive spirit was initially channeled into sports, baseball and basketball, which suited him perfectly. Siempre es un espíritu como Michael Jordan en el básquetbol. Es competitivo, altamente competitivo. Fidel was a very rebellious student. Uh, he had a couple of guns in his uh, dormitory. Uh, used to fight with other students. As a teenager, Fidel already stood out. He couldn't stay still and was quick-tempered but he did well in class. In 1944, Batista's four-year term as president came to an end. He withdrew from politics, traveled through Latin America, and settled in Florida, where he lived a life of luxury. It was here in 1945 that he celebrated victory in World War II with his American friends. Back in Cuba, Batista had been succeeded by Ramon Grau, his former co-revolutionary. But the new president did little to stop organized crime. The mafia ruled freely, reaping huge profits and extending a power base founded on corruption. In Chicago, New York, and Las Vegas, the mob bosses were wanted men, and Cuba was their safe refuge. The other guys are in Havana, raking in millions and millions and doing well, and everybody's happy, and everyone's getting fat, and everyone's getting fed, and they're building up Havana, and it's beautiful, and they're expanding, and they're saving monuments, and they're this, uh, this and that, and the beaches are beautiful. 
In order to restructure the mafia after the war, Meyer Lansky called a meeting of all leading families in December 1946 in Cuba. They were to gather at Havana's famed Hotel Nacional. Around a hundred guests attended. The bosses of mafia families, the most influential gangsters from the USA and Europe. Under Cuba's tropical sun, they were seeking to solve without bloodshed their disagreements on sharing out the loot. Havana Conference was about figuring out what the rules were going to be going forward, who was going to be in charge. Frank Costello, Albert Anastasia, Sam Giancana, Santo Traficante. Meyer Lansky managed to bring together every big name in the underworld, including the biggest of them all, Charles Lucky Luciano. After settling in Sicily just 10 months prior, Luciano smuggled himself to Havana on a freighter. His goal was simple, to take over organized crime in the United States once again. A lot of what Luciano wanted to establish in 1946 in the Havana Conference was what his role would be. And the way he did that was by being kind of uh, a diplomat bringing in mob families in the United States in order to figure out what their investments would be in Havana, what their investments would be in Las Vegas, which was just getting started. That meeting, um, I believe, was to just keep everything in check so things would go on smoothly. So it was like two governments. You had the government of the United States, the government of the world, and as Meyer used to say, we were not the underworld, we were the overworld. The conference lasted for a week and was accompanied by lavish entertainment. Ostensibly, the reason for many attendees to come to Havana was to see Frank Sinatra perform. Sinatra, however, was only in Havana on the express invitation of several Chicago mobsters. Throughout the conference, Cuban police steered clear of the Hotel Nacional. The government and civil servants were all party to shady dealings. Luciano set himself up at least for a while in Cuba. Uh, what ended up happening, though, is gossip columnists began writing about him and Frank Sinatra and plane loads of prostitutes coming into Havana. And the Truman administration was extremely upset by this because they felt that they had been slapped in the face. It was one thing to deport Luciano uh, to Italy. It's another thing if he's a few miles from Florida, basically still being the boss. Only under U.S. pressure did Cuban authorities relent and pressured Luciano to leave Havana, going into exile for a second and last time. So he ultimately was sent back uh, to, uh, to Italy, if for no other reason than to take heat off of the Mafia, because nobody is loyal to anybody when they create a lot of controversy. And Luciano was able to do almost as much as he could do from Italy that he could do from Havana, but not even Meyer Lansky wanted him in Havana after a while. Since then, Cuban slang has special words for its corruption practices. Botea and Chivo. Botea is a form of nepotism, whereby positions are appointed to friends and acquaintances, who are then supposed to return the favor later on. Und Chivo ist faktisch die Schaffung eines besonderen äh, Amtes oder Postens, wo jemand bezahlt wird für, für nichts. Ja? Überbezahlte Eliten, die nichts zu tun haben im Staatsapparat. Äh, das war Gang und Gäbe, das erwartete jeder, das äh, nimmt auch jeder sozusagen als Teil der politischen Kultur wahr. 
a small elite of high-ranking soldiers, and particularly American company bosses and their partners, were the big winners in post-war Cuba. For the rest of the people, prospects were grim. Income disparity increased dramatically, and Cuba's poor were getting poorer. Había 600 mil desempleados en aquel momento, y éramos 7 millones. Y era un despapajo. La situación en Cuba era un despapajo. A pesar de que dicen que era el tercer país en América Latina o el segundo. Entonces yo no me imagino cómo serían los otros. ¿no? In the late 1940s, Fidel Castro began studying law at the University of Havana. Well, law is, was a very common profession. Law and medicine were the principal profession that students studied in Cuba. And he was a, like the, the screaming, and that was a way to achieve political power. In other words, being a lawyer was first before you become a political leader. Universities were a hotbed of opposition against the Cuban government and its corruption. Groups with various affinities sprang up, among them were those who claimed allegiance to socialists or to communists. In aquel tiempo, estamos hablando del 52, 50. La Universidad de La Habana era muy grande. La, era la única universidad prácticamente que había en el país. L'université de La Havane est en, est en effervescence, il y a des, il y a des, des courants, on est vraiment dans la grande période latino-américaine où l'université est un espèce de quasiment de champ de bataille. Fidel Castro joined several armed groups. En plus, il faut quand même admettre que dans, dans le climat et dans la, dans la culture d'une société latino-américaine, puisque Cuba fait typiquement partie de l'Amérique latine, le côté un petit peu euh, macho, le côté un petit peu pistolero, euh, ça, 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 c'est plutôt bien vu, si vous voulez. Donc euh, voilà, il se trouve là-dedans euh, parce qu'il est presque naturel qu'il s'y trouve, compte tenu, si vous voulez, de son côté euh, bouillant, ardent et, euh, et, et euh, vous voulant trouver une place politique. Castro, aunque no era de los principales, figuraba entre los dirigentes estudiantiles que tenían fama de cáncer. Il adore cette, 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 cette période-là de sa vie est très importante parce qu'il va découvrir justement l'art de constituer des troupes, d'avoir un clan, d'avoir des hommes autour de lui. Et c'est tout doucement à travers cette, ce, ce, cette période de l'Université de la Havane qu'il va devenir réellement un chef politique. En 1947, a the revolt's organizers sought support among the rebellious students of Havana University. So Fidel Castro and a group of students went to a little cay, little island of the coast of Cuba, Cayo Confites, to train and in the use of machine guns and Molotov cocktails and grenades to go and fight. The group of students around Fidel Castro was stopped by soldiers and never reached the Dominican Republic. In 1948, shortly after the Dominican affair, Castro left Cuba for the first time and traveled to Bogota, Colombia. One reason was to get away from Cuban authorities for a while, who had grown suspicious of Castro. Once in Colombia, he realized that the country had the same problems as Cuba. C'était une période de fermentation au sens latino-américain. Par exemple, Castro a été amené en, en, en tant que membre d'une délégation des étudiants cubains à se trouver, pas tout à fait par hasard, mais, mais bien au-delà de ce qu'il avait imaginé au départ, pratiquement dans une révolution en Colombie, enfin à Bogota. A liberal presidential candidate in Colombia's upcoming elections had been murdered. His supporters took to the street, weapons in hand. Over 600 people were killed in the ensuing riots. Fidel Castro, as well as other Cuban students, were in the thick of things. After 10 hours of violence, government troops put down the uprising. Once again, 
there was no revolution for Fidel Castro. Donc, il en revient un petit peu auréolé de, de celui qui s'est trouvé sur l'événement. Castro's will to fight was unbroken, despite these revolutionary setbacks. Having graduated, he set up a legal practice, defending the poor in court. But once again, his endeavors failed. Also Castro ist ja lange Zeit, auch in seiner Studentenzeit, obwohl er ein charismatischer und guter Redner war, ist ja lange Zeit einer gewesen, der immer verloren hatte. Und das gehört wahrscheinlich in, den, in, den, in, den, in dieses Segment mit rein. Äh, der immer verloren hatte und von dem wahrscheinlich jeder gedacht hat, du bist einer von vielen, ja, die verlieren immer und die kommen mit ihren Projekten, ja, mit ihren großen utopischen Projekten nicht durch. As a lawyer, Castro was a failure, because he did not invoice his clients. This did not stop him, however, from making big plans in his private life. He wanted to get married. So he met my sister, well, at the university. She was studying uh, philosophy, and, and he was studying law. They were young, of course, you know, like, um, so they met. In 1948, Fidel Castro married Merta Diaz Belar. Her wealthy father paid for a lavish honeymoon in New York. Fidel Castro, à ce moment-là, quand il épouse Myrta Diaz-Balart, eh bien, il devient lui-même un des grands bourgeois de la région qui, a priori, pourrait finir aussi lié à la bonne société. Fidel se casa con la hija del ministro de l'intérieur de Batista. Casi, casi el segundo hombre de Batista. The new family soon found themselves in conflict over their private and political lives. The thought of my family or my father was that he was a revolutionary, that, you know, that was very hard. It would, it would be very hard for her to live, and that was, that was true. In 1952, former President Fulgencio Batista decided to return to Cuba. He wanted to run for the presidency again, and thus renew his political career. How poor Cubans lived after the war can be seen in the 1964 feature film, Soy Cuba. style of Batista and his cronies was considerably different. Mafia boss Meyer Lansky raised substantial amounts of money for Batista's election campaign. The FBI regarded Lansky as one of America's most influential gangsters. He himself always claimed to be an honest casino owner. They were places that were patronized by the finest people and had seating capacity, some of them as high as 800 people. And some of the finest people of the United States patronized these places. Also, your big charity balls were held there. And usually every year, the proms from that area were held there. Their fathers and mothers. There were not any nukes in some corner or somewhere. They were known all over America for their food and entertainment. There is little question that Meyer Lansky had thoroughly corrupted Batista, that he received millions and millions of dollars every year to let the mob do their thing. He was their partner. And, and he was able to put away a lot of money in Switzerland and, and other places. Batista's return proved to be more complicated than expected. Forecasts for the election were uncertain. It appeared that Batista was on the verge of a loss. Batista was still well connected with Cuba's army, as well as other influential Cubans. They had invested their money in Batista, but now it seemed that only a new coup d'etat could guarantee his rise to power. 
И когда он был президентом Кубы, законно избранным, с 40 по-моему, по 1944 год, коммунисты и все левые его поддерживали. Но после войны, когда началась холодная война, все вот эти прелести послевоенные, он, конечно, эволюционировал сразу в сторону Союза с Соединенными Штатами, стал сторонником подавления силового всех левых сил и, естественно, стал противником всех революционеров. In 1952, the Cubans were ready for a new election, and they expected a new election. Batista decided from Daytona with his military friends that he was going to take over power, that he wouldn't be elected. He was not popular in Cuba, so he wouldn't be elected. Se abatita del golpe de Estado porque no va a ser elegido y le teme a la elección del partido del pueblo cubano ortodoxo que amenaza con eh, ser el, el que castigue, el que purifique. El lema de los ortodoxos era vergüenza contra dinero y era una especie de, de bandera de pureza ideológica. Entonces Batista no quería que los ortodoxos llegaran al poder. Three months before the presidential elections, Batista took power in an almost bloodless military coup. His contacts within the army helped him become Cuba's head of state once more. Cuba's liberal constitution, which he himself had introduced a few years previously, was swept aside. His plans to take power were not only widely known beforehand, many Cubans welcomed the coup. Es hat ja keiner gezuckt. 52, am 10. März hat ja kein Mensch irgendwas gemacht, nicht mal die Kommunisten. Es hat niemand irgendwas gemacht. Also es gibt ein paar Proteste und so Zeitungen irgendwie so ein bisschen, aber eigentlich keine größere soziale Gruppe hat irgendwas gemacht, weil alle die Faxen von den Vorherregierungen so dicke hatten, dass sie gesagt haben, na endlich mal, schafft mal jemand, jemand Ordnung in dem System hier. The previous years had been marked by scandal and corruption. But many Cubans saw Batista as a man of morals, even though he made mafia boss Meyer Lansky his minister for gambling. Batista claimed to want to discipline democracy in Cuba. Major festivities were organized to rally the Cubans to his cause. Batista trató de todo lo que pudo de legitimarse. Él jamás tuvo un ministro militar. Incluso en los dos ministerios de las cuestiones militares y de represión siempre fue un civil el ministro. Él nunca se vistió de militar. Él trataba de que la gente lo aceptara. All democratic process was ignored, while the size of Cuba's police force was increased dramatically. Batista no longer had political ideas. Any opposition was violently repressed. Thus began the Batista dictatorship. Und da kippt er in 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 dieses diktatorenhafte, wie man also Diktatoren, also dieses blutrünstige äh, terroristische Diktatur. Entonces, en un ataque de testosterona, digo yo, eh, muchos jóvenes, jóvenes como como yo, pues reaccionaron en contra de Batista. No tanto por política, sino como por sentirse humillado. ¿no? Este hombre, porque tiene una pistola y tiene el apoyo del, del ejército, pues puede hacer lo que da la gana. La mafia was still doing business, but the major investors had gone. Even the US Army no longer invested in Cuba. The country deteriorated. After 1953, Cuba was a police state. Arrests were often arbitrary, as were torture and assassination. To terrorize the people, the police dumped their victims' corpses from moving vehicles. At least 2,000 people died due to police brutality. Fidel Castro, working as a lawyer in Havana, filed a suit against Batista's coup d'etat as it was unconstitutional. The courts rejected his case. Given that the fact that in 1944, he allowed elections, many people expected him to stay in power for a short time and then have elections. 
But as time went by, they realized that he wasn't going to have election, that he wanted to remain power and retain power. And then that's when the opposition began to develop. And nos lanzamos a la calle protestando contra Batista. Realmente no éramos de ningún partido. Éramos jóvenes estudiantes, pero teníamos ya la información de nuestros familiares, de nuestros padres, de que Batista había sido un gobierno negativo, malo para el pueblo. Having exhausted what he saw as all legal options, Fidel Castro decided that only armed rebellion could put an end to Batista's regime. Today, the Moncada Barracks in Santiago is a museum. In 1953, it was Cuba's second biggest military base. Fidel Castro put together a small group of revolutionaries in order to attack the barracks. Ce qui est de fascinant dans le castrisme, c'est que quand on regarde de près la manière dont les choses se passent, c'est toujours un peu improvisé, un peu avec un côté très amateur. Il y a un côté euh, étudiant un peu fou dans tout ça. Et la prise de la, 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 la caserne de la Moncada en est un exemple. The ambitious plan was to seize the barracks and the weapons within. Suponíamos, y es así fue planificado, que el cuartel se iba a tomar por sorpresa. The date was set for July 26th, 1953. The Moncada Barracks was a fortress in the heart of Santiago. Across the street from it was a civil hospital. Castro divided his men, some to storm the hospital in order to create a diversion, allowing the rest of his troops to take the barracks. Nosotros desde el hospital, al disparar sobre, lo, sobre el cuartel, atraeríamos una buena parte del barraje de fuego de los soldados hacia el hospital de, de manera que eso aliviaba la situación de los compañeros nuestros que eh, atacarían por el frente While carnival festivities were in full swing around Santiago Castro's men approached the barracks Parce qu'en en fait, en fait, ils avaient choisi le moment du carnaval. Pourquoi Parce que bah, ils, est, ils estimaient, euh, ces jeunes gens, 150 à peu près, ils estimaient qu'au au moment du carnaval, il bah, y, y a une partie des soldats qui seraient bourrés, euh, que, tout, enfin, que les, 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 les patrouilles seraient un peu moins organisées. But things went bad almost immediately. Pero lamentablemente hubo un incidente que se conoce. Los primeros carros que llegaron al cuartel, una guardia que no se contaba con ella y eso hizo que se, el alarma se sonara. While Cubans were dancing and laughing in the streets, Castro and his men pressed their attack. But the barracks guards opened fire almost immediately. Castro and his men were outnumbered and outgunned. Estuvimos disparando durante todo el tiempo, porque lamentablemente el factor secreto es sorpresa feo. Y así estuvimos hasta que se nos acabaron las municiones. Nineteen soldiers were killed, as were six rebels, before Castro and his remaining men surrendered. For the young lawyer turned rebel, it was another devastating defeat. 53 war a Castro, a ein Verrückter. Don Quixote. Don Quixote of Freiheit. 55 rebels were killed on the spot after being arrested. Only a few managed to escape. Most, including the Castro brothers, were put on trial. No one expected a fair hearing. Castro's revolution had been annihilated, and now the state wanted to show its power. The day after the attack, Florencio Batista visited the Moncada barracks and asked to see the weapons that had aimed to topple his regime. 
another battle for Cuba's freedom had been lost. But the war was far from over. 